So um, it ends up that the Kinah is really talking about who knew what when, meaning that for many of our vote and our you know, for our vote and for you know within history knew there was a case, they knew there was a time, that there was something that we were waiting for. It starts back from the time. This time was created, I guess, when sin came into the world with Adam. And Abraham was aware of it from Brit Bay Habitarim, and he was afraid. And he passed the secret on to Yitzhak. And from there, Yaakov knew. And we know from the story of when he was ready to bless his sons that he told his sons he would be telling them what would happen and um, and yet, Hashem took away the Ruach HaKodesh from him so as not to reveal the secret of what, what when, and what would be. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu knew there would be a case. After all, he was responsible for he was responsible for helping bring about Ula number one, and he only got exasperation. You know, considering he led the people out of Mitzrayim, and it was through him that they were supposed to enter into Eretz Yisrael. So. That didn't work out so well, which is exactly what gets us to the point of Tisha B'Av, the idea that Moshe knew how the rhythm was supposed to go, and yet we as a people had already ruined that timing. And so the Nabim after him, even when we got to the land of Israel, spent their time telling us it's not, this is not going to be forever if this is the way we're going to be. And uh, certainly we had a taste of the experience of Korban in the sense that Mishkan Shiloh, which we, was both beloved by us and misused by us, also, was that example of having a midah that was lost, and it was to a certain extent a small taste of the experience, because after all, that was just Shiloh, that wasn't even Yerushalayim. And so, we had warning, and it came to an end, Yerushalayim, and so now, once again, we wait to find out what will happen, or when will it be back, or we say, I mean, to a certain extent, in this, in this kina. There is, there is a moment where there's a play on words from the question of Adam, Ayeka. Without an if you look at the spelling, it becomes Echa. And so for, for man, as, as his person that led to Galut, he was asked, Ayeka, where are you? What did you do? How did you drop the ball? Why did you give up your responsibilities? And to that, it comes us saying, Echa, how could this happen? Of which I suppose part of the answer is very is a question that's very human. It's not even a Jewish question, because Adam predates that. The idea of having lived up to our responsibilities. And yet, on the other side of it, is uh, something that actually is a carryover from Kina 13, which is, again, the letters Echa, how could this happen, turn into the question that is asked by us, I guess, in the voice of Abraham Avinu, a code. Abraham was told, Ko Iyazaraha, this is how your children will be like in the sand, like the stars, like this blessing that would happen. And then here we sit on Tisha B'Av and ask Echa, how can we come to this? And in the voice of Abraham, we're asking also Echo, how, where's the bracha, where's the promise? Is it time yet? We certainly know that in our Tilo daily, we say, or throughout the week, we say Admatai. We say Admatai in, let me just check, I wrote it down to myself. We say Admatai when we say the Shir Shalyom of uh, Wednesdays. On Wednesdays, we say Admatai Shein Hashem, Admatai Shein Yaluzu. How long can this go on that there are bad people that the Shein seem to be able to trounce across the world without consequence? Well, to a certain extent, we are suffering the consequence. When we say when we say Tachanan, or certainly when Dachshun Azim say Tachanan, we say, again, asking how long can this go on? Uh, we're, you know, and then finally, we say this also about Shaharim Shabbat, when we say, please, you know, give us a chance, give us a chance. How long will this go on? We certainly know we that. We can't hear. We can't hear. It's very muffled. You want me to raise this to the. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I don't want it to like fall. It's like it's thing. Is this better? Keep talking. Let's see. Is that better? Okay, so we certainly know we deal with the conundrum of Bihita Akushena, that we've been told that the that the Gula will come at its time, but it will be hurried. And so how could that be? So I think that the thing we're left with 
is the fact that this, by the way, turns out nicely uh, for Parshat or Parshat Shavua, that we're told at the beginning, it's a big question of whether it's a mitzvah or not. The beginning of the Aseret HaTvarim is Anochi Hashem Alotecha, Hashem Hutsiti Chamer, Tetzvayim Ibeka Vadim. I am Hashem, your God, who's taken you out of Egypt from the house of slaves. And so there's a question about whether or not this is a mitzvah. It doesn't sound like a mitzvah. It doesn't seem to be telling us what to do. It just seems to be a statement by God, a statement which is a foundation for all of our mitzvot. And yet, the question is, what, what are we supposed to do about that statement? And so um, the Sefer Mitzvah Rakatan tells us that um, we know that there's a tradition that when a person goes up to Shemayim after, um, after 120 years, that he's asked about whether he did you know, the following things, which would be what a Jew should do with his life. And one of them is Tzipita Lishua. Did you wait? For the geula, did you every day say your ani mami b'chol yom achakelo? Did you wait for the geula? Did you believe that the geula was supposed to come? Right, and tzipita means you anticipated, meaning you didn't doubt it was going to happen, but every day you said maybe today. And so the sefer mitzvot hakatan says that this idea of us waiting for the geula is our way of averring our belief that anochi Hashem alokecha, that I am Hashem your God, and the aspect of asher hoseiticha. That the same Hashem who took us out of Mitzrayim is the same Hashem for whom we are waiting for this final geula to take us out of the state we are in right now. And as um, as I think it is Nusach Sfarad says in um, in their kedusha on Shabbat, "Hein ga'alti etchem acharit kereshit." If we can believe that Hashem will um, will redeem us in the end of days, the same way He redeemed us in the beginning. That's the way we can fulfill our part of this chain of knowing, not knowing when the case will be, when this will be over. And so now I'm going to switch to reading the Tihila, uh, the Tina, sorry. I will read it again. We can notice the fact that it is in the Aleph Bet order, that every beginning of a stanza has two Alephs, two Bets, two Gimels. There is some sort of very intricate uh, design also with part of Echa, which most, uh, I mean, they wrote here that it has, it's very hard to tell, so I'm not going to bring it up. I can't appreciate it. But I'm going to begin reading it, and you're welcome to join me to read together. Echa et asher kfar asuhu tava neni dehibot nishiyehu. Asher adlo shkatim nintahu v'shali ramaz v'ha'eretz hayta tohu. Bila v'ot arvit v'shacharit ge'e magid merishit acharit. Banoi v'chari v'banoi acharit mechobacharit Umechobai kal kal to hecharit. Hecharit ishon vechoshak mi yuda vekadmonim chazuhu mi yuda. Az vashe doro mi totsu noda ad lo asoi karnotav gada. Gada gavoha komat yitzir tsar ze sefer lepanav huv tsar. Galmi raui necha hechzir hechzar. Pausing there just to say that's the point where it's a play between Echa, the tension between Echa and Ayeka. Sarlo, her Ab Masha Haya, Mutats Kir Natoy, the Derhat Huya, the Dorot, we made Nehot Nehiv and Nehya, Al Shever Asher Haya. Haya ha nu'ar mi mizrach, bein ha betarim oro kizarach. Herahu arba malchiyot beredem betarach, ki tava sha'ar ha mizrach. Ve'yachamos v'inatzel zeirach, v'yar hashachat mizrach, u've'ima nofelet mizrach, v'tzidak midat hadin ta'az ra'ah. Ra'ah erom ve'erya, v'ne'enach v'la'akudo sozet ta'anach. Zanach <laughs> Mordim zavol mitzchunav nivu umas merot ne alimo bekarkayoto 
תבעו, זיף שעריו מני מה נתבעו, וגינם תמונים בארץ כי תבעו, תבעו טורדים לידה זמן, כי לגלו קיץ אב זומן, טוב מי שגילה לו קיץ מזומן, הישה והבליג בקיץ קמן, ישבו ישאלו לאב לידה, קיץ הפלאות מתי יוודע, ייקר ליום ישוע ולא נודע, עד כי בעיתו יוחש ויתוודע, יתוודע רז לעם, וכאן נסתק. קלו ונכסה מהם לא יוכלו. ראיך מתכונת ביתך נחמלו יגון את החיים על קלו. קלו כסלי ציר תשולח ונם שלח נא יד תשלח כי מבצע לי ותשתלח ואחרי גילתי ישולח. לאמותם לבבו או לבי סוף איזה יום הפסוף ליבם הכין לשורר מסוף. אדוני ילוך בזרועה חשוב, חשוב ביד רמה נגלה בימין רוממה, בנים קשרו, חימה זרומה, קצרה נפשם בגי אדום דעת על מה. מה מצאת עבלתה בי? כי בגוד בגדת בי, ממדבר המרת בי, ועד עתה לא האמנת בי. נביעייך נטעי אביגדור, נשתברו פרצות לגדור. נגליתי יום נקם לסתור, ולא חודשו קצי הדור. הדור יזמו דעת סוד, ודפקו, והשבעתי אתכם שמעו וחכו. יחד כשומעם זאת נתמכו, ועל כפיים ספקו. ספקו ששו באי הארץ, כי נפלו בידם מלכי ארץ, סברו כי ישעם ירץ. ועל ידם יתכונן לסוף כל הארץ. פץ אוכל לאדוני בשלום, דימו כי לעד ישם מושלו, פעלו שקר והשילו, עד כי יבוא שילו. שילו ריצה, ככלה מעיסה, ונמאס כאשר בו נעשה, ראו מה אבירה עושה, וכל אשר חפץ עשה. עשה עם ייעוד בצביון, ובעיתו חש עלי תשיון. אלופתי כחורב בציון, עד אשר יופיע אלוהים מציון. צעק ציון איך נתן, לשום עלי גוי איתן, צהל ורקע על המפתן, ובחמתו חיתיתו נתן. נתן גאותו את הובילני רוקני, קרתי לעד בעל חוממי, בושתי וגם נכלמתי בל בהקמי. ובכורי אף גם לי קומי. קומי קשבתי בהזנחה, קומי ולכי כי לא זאת המנוחה, קצתי בחיי מאנחה, והגשתי ולא ארבה ממך. ראה רואה נפשי זנוחה, משלום ומשלווה ומהנחה, רטושה בהרי נשך אנוחה, גם שם לא נחה. נחה ידו בם, ובה נכבו, אנושים על ראשם כרק עברו. ידעו על נהרות בבל כי נתעכבו, וכעוללו עוללו בחוצה שחרו. שכבו שובים גרים מדקירים, מתעוללים במו כמו בקרים, שהם יזובו מדוכרים, ומי פרת קרבים או דוכרים, תקרא תוקף טבח ומזח מבקירים, קיר עירה מקרקרים, וכל עם ולשון בם סוקרים, ועליהם מכוננים בני ציון היקרים. היקרים כל ברמה השמיעו לבחור, למה זה ועל מה זה הקרינו כה, יחד זה אומר בכה, וזה אומר בכה, רדנו להמיר לשון אחד בלשון איכו. mourn the Kurban of the Betei Mikdash, but it, since the time of Tisha, the original Tisha B'Av, this is from the time of the original Tisha B'Av, where Bnei Israel didn't believe that they could get into the land, though God had promised them, this deed has become a deed of more than just the destruction of the temple. And throughout time, it's been designated as a bad day to which bad days are, or should I say horrible days, are associated or are, are like almost like it, 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 attracts the, it attracts tragedies. And so our keynote on Tisha B'Av, after a certain point, become 
about different times in our history, different things that have also occurred in on or around Tisha B'Av. And um, there's the first crusades officially commenced. Then the Jews were expelled for England around then. The Jews were expelled from France, Jews expelled from Spain, Germany entered World War I, which I guess the aftermath of which then led to World War II, the Holocaust. The, um, the final solution was created on, on Tisha B'Av and the mass deportation of Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto also um, was on Tisha B'Av. So it's at this point that I suppose I'm going to turn to a Kina 22, which describes mass suicides in Jewish European communities during the Crusades, in which people would rather have um, killed themselves and killed their children rather than uh, be forced to convert to Christianity. Within this kina, the reason why I chose it is within this kina, there is a there is a stanza that really has always um, moved me very much. And so I'm just going to say to you before we even begin to read it, you'll notice it when we get to it. There's a sense of the fact that while they were waiting, I guess, to be to be attacked and be given the choice of, I suppose, life or not even just being taken and being converted or killed, there was a fear that the children, even if they did this to the adults, the children would be taken <laughs> and the children would be converted. And this fear of, of it led them to kill their own children, their younger children. And they said, since we were not Zochim to be able to raise you to Torah, then we will at least get the zakot of doing the akidah. Now, this to me is a uh, is a terrible tension because I know that I personally I have a son who always does me the favor of reading the akidah and Rosh Hashanah and the tune of the Rosh Hashanah leaning. And there's just something about having a son who at the time was not wearing matim but was in the army who would be reading the Akhidah in that voice. And we know that we look at the story and as our Misora, we always hold on to the idea that Akhidah Yitzchak, oh, the lesson of Akhidah Yitzchak is that Hashem doesn't want us to lose our children. Hashem doesn't want us to sacrifice our children. And yet when you have, certainly today we feel it, when you have a child who is in Madim, when you have a husband, you have a relative who's wearing uniform. And certainly at this time, when we're in fighting, there is an aspect of sometimes you do the Hashem does want us to sacrifice. And so how and that that kina of the idea that the parents thought that at least if they could not raise their children to Torah, that at least their children should be able to become the Akedah, to me is such an astounding idea. Because I think we do know that there are Akedos that happen. And certainly the best way to say it is that there is a tension between the idea that the Misorah we have is the Akedah, that God doesn't want human sacrifice. And yet we know we have the mitzvah of dying al Kiddush Hashem, Niktash Jibotov B'nai Israel, that we have this idea that there are times in which the only thing to do, which is what happened during the Crusades, what they felt was appropriate, is that if you can't remain faithful to God, if you can't, during certainly during the time of Shmad, where there is, uh, you know, usually you say there are three mitzvot that you should or that you should be killed rather than do. But certainly at a time where the Jews are being singled out and anything that breaks the Jewish people becomes a chilol Hashem, at those times, one is supposed to sacrifice one's life. And um, all we can hope is that even though this tension exists through our history, we can hope there will become a day that these, these sacrifices will be, again, sacrifices in the Mikdash. Again, we'll be able to turn these deaths of Kiddush Hashem to become back what they should be, the replacement, the ayal, the karbanot that come instead. And certainly we can hope that maybe our 
following in the footsteps of Abraham won't involve a challenge of sacrifice, whether we'll be able, willing to sacrifice our children. You're bringing Echa to me. You are really bringing Echa to me. Excuse me for interrupting. Sorry. I feel like it's coming straight from Shemaim. It's mind. deeply wow. said. It's so deeply said. Thank you. Um, so the idea being that maybe we can instead follow the footsteps of Abraham and instead of being um, being this need of sacrificing or not sacrificing, maybe the reason Abraham was chosen is because he was going to bring about, uh, that he was going to bring about the raising of his children to bring about Sakab Chesed, bring the world into Mishpat, and maybe we know Siomi Mishpat Sipadem, maybe that aspect of Abraham will be able to do instead. And so with that, I'm going to open up to this kina about that addresses the crusades and the sacrifice that people made during that time. This is kina 22. And I'm going to read it and I'll pause when I get to the paragraph again that I pointed out. I read this Sikhi Ve'enima. I'm really sorry. Did I say I am on the right one, right? I apologize. Having an out of body experience. <laughs> Rosh Kalhutso, Niglatam Kisuka, or the Live Tapai Nakshabu, Kinson Tifra. Elila Alzo, Bidimati Al Lecha, He Asfu Elai, Dibuye Son Nidaha, La Harbo Tabahi, La Harim Hatsavaha, He Lilu Shamayan, Visa Aki Adama, Arib Vesiki, Ahima, the Honiki Arima, Er Alim Sau, Visa Aku Mara, Support Tamur, He Adubahabura. Aval Adru Mura, the Tera, the Halom Rosh, the Croach Shizra, Shizira, the Elemo di Bruba Amira, the Zahino Lagad of the Torah, Naki Sem Kaola, the Haktara, Vinis Ket Imasem, Loora, Hatsuna, me in Kol, the Aluma, I read the Sifi Bahima, the Kolihi Arima. As his king of Dovi Mikhani, the Kabel de Ahava, the Inshokin, the Onim, whose king him the Shayim Baran in name. Him Hayut Hila Nidonim, the Atule Katama Zepanim, the Nerhu Hamonim Hamonim, the Nit Arbu Pidarim in Parshadorim. Vahavod Asher Hayu Rahmanim, the Nehatula Azar Kaya Inim, the Hifiso Al Avot Vahavanim, Umisha Boral Alalo Vishonim, Hunishat Vahalafot, the Sakinim, Vahurim Ali Tola and Munim, him. La Hakua Far Katanim, the Hakalot the Ushot Shanim, the Ulafot is Raot Katanim, the Nutahot the Hereb, the Hidonim, the Hruzo Kahaladat Nibonim, the Altahatu Meharbot Kinim, the Haspido Al Hasidim Bahadunim, Asher Salalu, the Mayan Hazedonim, the Zephyr Zot Nachia Duma, I read the Sikhiba Ahima, the Homidi Arima. Torah Torah Hidrisa, Palchi Baaparim, Evil Yahid, Asila, Mispe Tamurim, Alto Se Mishotayef, Uforse Mahmorim, Malachayef Bahoblayef, 
the Mayan Adirim, or they me or me are of faith, me a shrake Hadirim, me a fan, they to who nigh me dalin is to ring. Tia Katsa, me a Katsa, they give a oath, who me is a take the harim, me a fare cavayo, me a tare shvarim, me a fleet nizero, who me ya a rope the darim, me a shaderma ama, Kimbaha to the harim, who me a home milhama take, the ashogla sharim, Kali. Sorry, play Melchama Abdu, Benaflu Gigorim, Ashrehem Maskilim, Karakia Zoharim, Bimnukot Shalom Nahu Yisharim, Oi Bavoy Shot Bashaver, Lenotarim, Lunidivat Nefesh, Bahavadim Betsirim, Lithilion Inayim, Zomavet, Lo Sidarim, Erev Omrim, Ye Thames Farim, Uvoker Mitzakim, Ye Gala Orim, Mimar E, Enemo, Asherhemas Sharim, Mikhutz shiklacherev be'ima mechadarim. Ad matai tabit ro'ev kostarim, tane l'toratcha asher bal'u neharim, kla'uha fra'uha fra'uha l'zarim, kesirim subufim higdilu ha'madurim. Ha'al'ila tit'apak adon kol yitzurim, tinkondam ha'nishpach kamayim ha'mugarim, mishod aniyim me'antak se'urim, am... Shave Pesha, the Umim Umerurim, Kuma, the Hinase, Al Sarim Hatorim, Pamera, the Masu of Tarima, Arita Sihiba, Hima, the whole Nehi Arima. Okay, we are on Kina number 24, Chaf Dalit. Some versions of this Kina, um, as the one in the Koran uh, Kino, it's not the one in the Art Scroll Kina, begin with the following opening words from Echa 116. Ela ani bochia. Eni, eni, your day, your For these things do I weep, my eyes flow in tears. There is so much to cry about when we describe in depth, in depth the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. In the Cardo, in the Jewish Quarter, right now, there's actually a display called Al-Ela Anibokhia, which shows symbols of loss from the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash up until today um, in the war in Kharbot Barzo. Uh, this keynote was written by Rabbi Eliezer Hakalir. And it is written in the reverse alphabet order. Um, and it details the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Al-Khorban Beit HaMikdash ki horas v'chi hudash eskoi v'chol shana v'shana misped chadash al-Hakodesh al-Hamikdash. Upon the destruction of the temple that was torn down and trampled upon, I shall lament with a new elegy every year for the holy vessels and for the sanctuary. Every year, we need to keep Tisha B'Av relevant. In this Kina, we see that we're not only mourning the temple, but we're also mourning the Kali, the vessels that were destroyed and taken into exile, one by one, as well as the loss of the service of the Kohanim and the Levim, who serve God, as well as the diminished role of the angels. Not only were our vessels vandalized, by Nebuchadnezzar. They were also sent as gifts to the pagan temples of the Babylonian exile. As we see the unraveling of the Beit HaMikdash, we are reminded of the days when the Mishkan in the wilderness and the, the Beit HaMikdash of King Shlomo were established and dedicated with each precious vessel being prepared and placed in its proper spot. We are reminded how far we have fallen and how much we have lost. God hid and silenced the angel's song. The fire burned between the poles of the Aram. Shnei tashim asher b'mala u'mata zel gabezeh ha'aflu ba'alata. God watched as the two temples, the Beit HaMikdash Shalmala, the heavenly Beit HaMikdash, and the Beit HaMikdash Shalmata, the earthly Beit HaMikdash, were darkened in gloom. 
The earthly Beit HaMegdash was directly below the heavenly Beit HaMegdash. When we lost our Beit HaMegdash, we also lost the connection to God's temple and to the Shekhinah, yet another reason to lament. The ark's poles were buried, no longer protruding from the curtains. Four fiery poles made their way down to the temple. There are two opinions as to what really happened to the Aram, to the ark. The first opinion is that Nebuchadnezzar took the ark with him to Babylonia along with the other vessels. The second opinion, as presented here in this kina, is what we learn in the, in the Talmud in the Sapphic Yoma 54b. When King Yoshia was informed that the Beit HaMikdash should be destroyed, he removed the ark from the Kodesh Kodesh and he hid it in one of the underground passageways that King Shlomo built under the Beit HaMikdash. The question of what happened to the ark is still a fascinating concept today. The fate of the Aram was even the topic of Steven Spielberg's movie, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. According to Sikta Rabba, the four flaming coals are heavenly fire. God preferred to set the temple on fire from the Babylonian, uh, before the Babylonians could claim responsibility. When the Kodesh of Kodeshim, the Holy of Holies, was desolate and ceased to become a holy habitation, God proclaimed and well, my tent is plundered. The crown of your glory, the temple, was delivered in the hands of your tormentors with all of the most precious vessels, the most desirable of the treasured house. The Kina lists what was taken or destroyed. The two pillars fell and were smashed. The ten tables were taken away to Shinar, Babylonia, and given to harlots. The Srafim, the angels, the part of their stations when the bases of the washstands were demolished, the villains called for annihilation. The copper pool, the Sea of Solomon, and the ten wash basins were given over to the god of Babylon and were broken. The vessels were very sturdy copper, yet they broke so they would not be used for idolatry. The wheels of the Merkava, the celestial chariot, lowered to the earth. The cherubs were taken down from the temple walls. All of the kali, the vessels, gold and silver, were torn out and plundered from the flaming temple. The angels were bewildered as a woman in labor. The house of prayer was reduced to rubble. The celestial singers were silenced from song. The Kohanim and the Levine were slaughtered at their stations. Vessels and the bearers were sent into captivity. Sarim, nobles, and Skanim, assistants, were dragged away in chains. Midrash TV teaches that when Abuqai Netzar ordered crushing burdens placed on the captives' backs to break their noble stature, the angels descended to help them bear their loads. The angels exchanged their linen clothing for sackcloth. Nebuchadnezzar Netzar arrogantly extinguished the menorah. He darkened the light of God. This kia ends with the words, Azapti et beti benaklati natashti. I abandoned my house and I deserted my inheritance. God laments losing his house. May we have the opportunity to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash speedily in our days so that God can return to his house and we can worship God there. May all those who have lost their homes have the opportunity to return and rebuild. And may all of our hostages be returned. Okay, so we're gonna to read together in you know, number 24. Al Ella Nibokia, Aini Aini, you are done mine. Al Korban Beit Hamidash, he horas, the Queen Pudash, as Poe Bokoshana, Misted Hadash, Al Kodesh Al Nidash. Tisater la Alam Tarshishim Meron, Tisazata Ola Mikne Haron, Hilhata Esh Ben Bade Aron. Shinik <laughs> 
אנקן כף אל כף, ושאלת הידי. ספירת הפרטחה הניתנה ביד שר, וכל כלי חמדה יבוא עם האוצר, ולך הכוח והגבורה ונמנו עצר. פני הכיסא אז יפלו, ובני השמיים לתרות הושפלו, יכין בו ובועז להשתבר הנפלו. עשרה שולחנות עד שולדו, ולאורכיהם נמו איה אדון אלו, לתרות שנער לקדשים כהון חלו. שרפים עומדים נעו נמעד, כנרסו מכונות מתוך מחמד, זרים קראו ימי השמד. נחושת גם בעשרה כיורות, כי נמסרו לבל והינם שבורות, ושני המאורות מאז פטורות. מעשה האופנים אשר במרכבה, הורדו לארץ זוהר הרקיע קדה, קולש על גויים לפני קרובים בה. לביאות המורד מאת הורדו, הצללים עוד לברכה לא ירדו, כלבים רעים על מתי אב דודו. כל כלי הכסף וכלי הזהב פוצצו ושוסו מבית הלהב, בצאת ההדר שפפו עוזרי רהב. יום אשר נקרא מהומה נבוכה, להקת מלאכים כאישה מצבה נבוכה, דיבור פתח ועלו אחריו איכה. טס עמוני ומואבי והוציאו הקרובים ובכליבם היו בם מסובבים. הנה ככל הגויים בית יהודה חשובים. חיל שרפי מלאך הולף מגדולתו ואל אדיר שמו לא אבד תהילתו לגלים פירושם בית תפארתו. זמרי שחה הגשו מנועם, בנם מה לכם פה אין היום תם? מה תכלסו למלך בשעת הזעם? והכהנים והלוויים על משמרתם נשחטים, ועל מחלוקותם שעתת אף שרדיותים, ונאמרו איה מלך אסור ברהטים. הכלים והמשמשים בשבי הולכים, הסבים והסגנים בקבל משוחים. ותמור בדים סף חברו מלאכים. דת צלבי יפקח עיניו, הנה יפאל הלך לפניו, וסבים הולכים כבדים חזו המונף. גאווה עתה וכיבה את המנורה, ונטע ידו אל אל המורה, ויחשיך אור עוטה אורה. ושגו כארי בדביר בל, ורף דודי כאל מת מתאבל. פקדון הרוחות בו בלילה לא קיבל, אמר למשחיתים חמתי היתכתי, את ידידות נפשי בכך אויביה נתתי, עזבתי את ביתי ונחלתי נטשתי. מרים וייט is going to come now and read us Kino 31 and 45, as the special Kino that is written by Rav Yosef Svi Vimon. As we look at Kina 31, um, there's a very interesting reality that one realizes when one goes through life that most things are really bittersweet. Um, even at a height of a simcha, at a wedding, at the chuppah, the couple is about to start their life together. They break the glass, remembering the korban, and that very high moment of ecstasy, of happiness, is mixed in with the idea that we're not fully where we're supposed to be, that we're in pain, that there's sorban. We might have gone to smachot, could have been a brit milah of a family member, of a friend, who names a child after a loved one who passed away. And although this new life has so much joy that it's brought already to the family, there's a mix in of that bittersweetness, that life is complicated, that things are almost a double-sided coin, where we have simcha, we have suffering, and where we have suffering, there's always the hope of simcha. As we look at this kina, 
This team actually makes a little bit of a transition of what we've been doing so far this morning, where we've been lamenting, where we've been discussing tragedies that almost have no comfort. The beginning of this Kina, what we are trying to do here is we're trying to transition our mindset a little bit, not fully, but a little bit, in that as we're on the floor crying and lamenting the tragedies that have befallen our people, we also start with a bit of a spark of hope to the future, where we don't only think about the horrendous past in which we've lived through, but the potential of the amazing and unbelievable Gula that we're always hoping to experience. This kina goes through a stanza, one after the other, the first one being that of the ecstasy and the happiness that we experienced when we left Mitzrayim, when we were at the height of the height of our people, when we felt like we were on top of the world, Hashem showed himself to us. He just performed the most amazing makot. Our enemies have been destroyed. We were coming out of slavery after so much suffering walking towards a beautiful future. And the first line of this stanza alternating throughout the entire kina talks about this amazing experience that we had leaving Mitzrayim. The second stanza alternating throughout the kina has a different tone. It's that double-sided coin. It's that mixture of happiness and bitterness. And the second stanza talks about what it was like to leave Yerushalayim what it was like to go into Galut without knowing when we would come back, the pain that one feels when one leaves Yerushalayim. The author is unknown. We don't know exactly who penned this kina. It's written in alphabetical order, and like I said, switches off between the height of leaving Mitzrayim and the low of leaving Yerushalayim. A tune was made to capture this moment where the first stanza is said with a allegro, with a, with a high, high note, and the second stanza is more whispered. It's said a little bit softer. The, the melody goes down. In order to capture that moment, how music can transport us from where we are to where we want to be, in, in, in saying the words, we also have that tune that allows us to do so. An interesting comment is made, I, I believe it's even here, um, Xerox for you on the, uh, at the bottom of the, of the sheet here. One of the things that were mentioned is that Tisha B'Av was not just the day in which we, you know, mourn the loss of both Batei Mikdash, but all the various different calamities that have befallen our people throughout Jewish history. And as was mentioned earlier, we have no shortage, whether it be the expulsion from England, whether it be the expulsion from Spain, which we'll talk about in just a few moments, whether it was the Crusades, whether it was the book burning that took place in Paris, never ending. But specifically here it's mentioned that on Tisha B'Av of 1492, where the Jews of Spain, where the golden era of Spain was coming to an end, a remarkable psaac was given. The Barbanel himself writes this, that as the Jews were leaving Spain, the rabbis all allowed the orchestras to play a song before them, even Dafka on Tisha B'av, live music on Tisha B'av, as they were leaving from their beautiful homes, from their Bate Midrash, from whatever it is that they built over the many, many years that they lived in Spain and contributed to the society. Dafka then, they were playing music. And so one asks the question, what, what, was, what was the thinking behind this psaac? So perhaps the rabbis thought that as they're going into the unknown in a negative and horrible way, right, that uh, potentially it was to keep up their spirits, to keep up their understanding that what they were doing was 100% correct. Instead of giving in to the enemy and converting, they were leaving and that ultimately it should give them the courage and the strength in order to move forward. But I heard from Rabbi Ari Leibowitz, a beautiful uh, idea, I think, that also begins to give us a little bit of nechama, perhaps even in our day, which is that the rabbis understood it's not a tragedy, tragedy to leave galus. They were going from one galus to another galus, 
So Spain didn't work out for them, so they went to North Africa. And when North Africa didn't work out for them, they went to France. And when France didn't work out for them, they came back to England. And they went and they went until maybe they came to America. Wherever it was, they were constantly going one goes to another goes to another goes, but that's not a tragedy. What's the tragedy? Betesi Yerushalayim. When we left Yerushalayim, when we left home, that's a tragedy. That's when we have to begin to cry. That's when we have to begin to think to ourselves, there's, there's nowhere else for us to go. There's nowhere else for us to be. From one goes to another goes, I'll find, I'll find my way. But when I leave from home, where else am I supposed to go? I have to go into someone else's home, be a guest. I know it's only temporary. And so when we say this stanza, of Yerushalayim, the pain that is really felt here, is that we are going into Galut. However, the Kina does end with something, and specifically in our generation, I think we are extremely blessed. If you look at the end stanza, says, The author of this kina realized to infuse a word of Nechama at this point, at this junction of Tisha B'Av, where we try to transition a little bit and try to think about the Nechama as well. How hopeful and how glad and how Special it will be when we return to Yerushalayim. Now here we are, doing keynotes in Yerushalayim, in a beautiful Beit Midrash for women, <laughs> on a beautiful day. We are a blessed generation to say that we have returned to Yerushalayim. But why do we still have a tear at the corner of our eye? Because even as we say this, last stanza with the, the amount of hope in which it infuses this kina with, we know that we're not fully there. No one has to be reminded how difficult it's been this past year and how difficult it's been personally, nationally. However, one thing that we can hold on to is that we have returned to Yerushalayim. We have nowhere else to go. The tragedy is going from Galut to Galut. We're here to stay. And so perhaps as we say this kina, contrasting the height of our feelings of joy when we left Mitzrayim to become a nation, to receive the Torah, to come into Eretz Yisrael, and we contrast it with the pain and the suffering we felt once upon a time when we had to leave Yerushalayim. Although we're still yearning to live in a fully rebuilt Yerushalayim at the Beit HaMikdash, the Nechama at the end of this Kina is that we are here in Yerushalayim. We're not going anywhere. And we say this with that mixture of bittersweetness, that Bezrat Hashem, next year, we won't have to say the contrast, but rather we just talk about the miracles and unbelievable Yeshuot that we experience of being home in Yerushalayim. So please join me in singing. I'll, uh, I'll uh, lead us in uh, Kina 31. Eish tu kad bekir bi bahaloti alidi bi betesi mi mitzrayim in ma'ira ma'askira betesi mi Yerushalayim as yeshir Moshe shir lo inaf Ma 
Right, we're going to now turn to Kina 45, Relizio. <clears throat> Following the theme of a little bit of a transition in terms of the type of keynotes, this as well has a very interesting uh, duality to it, um, where the opening line, well, Zion and her cities, like a woman suffering from birth um, travel or from childbirth, and like a maiden, like a maiden gritted in sackcloth, lamenting for her husband of her youth, gives us a little bit of an interesting perspective throughout the entire Pina as this becomes a stanza that we repeat over and over again as we recall the horrors and the destruction in which we've experienced during the time of the Horban and beyond, that this is all in a certain way like a childbirth experience. A woman who is blessed to uh, have children knows that it is not an easy process, that there is a lot of pain, that there is a lot of um, discomfort, um, and Dafka specifically during childbirth, probably the height of the pain um, is, is at its height. And in general, thank God for modern medicine where they have different uh, medications, epidurals that can alleviate some of the pain. But no one will tell you that having a, a child, nurturing that life for nine months is easy and definitely at the pinnacle as a child is about to be born, whether in any form of birth, whether it's uh, giving birth or even if one has to even, I would extend it to having a C-section, the recovery and all of that, it's not something that one feels good afterwards. And yet, we find Baruch Hashem, that people are constantly hoping and looking to grow their families. And the question is why? You've gone through such a traumatic experience. You just felt you know, horrible over the last nine months, and you want to do it again. You just probably had one of the most painful experiences that you could have had in birthing a child, and yet you want to do it again? What's what's going on here? And so the authors of this Kina understood that amidst suffering, amidst the pain, amidst the travail, when we know that there is something at the end of it that is worth it, we're willing to go through that pain. We're willing to push ourselves and to know how to be able to get through that difficult and challenging time in order to get the prize, in order to get the end result of what we want. In the case of the mashal, the child, and perhaps what we're talking about here nationally is that as much travail, as much pain, as much anguish as we go through as a nation, we know that at the end, we're fighting for the gula. We're fighting for a chance to be with Hashem in that intimate way that we once had when he had his bayit, his Beit HaMikdash, where we could visit, where we could serve him, where we were able to be one with God. And so it's hard to say on an individual level, it's worth going through the suffering, it's worth going through the heartbreak in order to get to where we need to go. But definitely on a national level, what we're, what we're saying is that as a nation collectively, we've suffered so much. But we haven't given up hope ever because we know that as a nation, we're working towards a goal in which we know it will be worth it. We know that as a nation, we're working towards Gula. I think this is an extremely, extremely powerful concept as we close um, keynotes almost every year with this Kina. I think in a certain way, it imprints in our hearts and it validates the, the, the very difficult challenges that we've all experienced nationally throughout this millennia. 
but that it imprints in our hearts that hope, that ability to say that all of this are stepping, stepping stones towards the gula, stepping stones to that prize, to that thing that we want most, to be home in Eretz Yisrael, to have the Beit HaMikdash, to have peace amongst brothers, to live in peace amongst neighbors. And this is really ultimately the, the song that, that brings us there. I think it also teaches us so much that in the midst of suffering, there are little, little seeds that are planted for Nachama as well as for Gula. I'll just share a, a personal example that, uh, that spoke to me um, a number of years ago. I was uh, a madricha on an NCSY summer program called Give, uh, where they have girls from around North America come to Israel for the summer and they they um, volunteer in various different capacities, whether it's in hospitals, nursing homes, food kitchens. And uh, this is going back a number of summers ago. I'm forgetting already the year. But we, uh, we came the summer in which there was a horrible uh, forest fire in, in the Carmel Mountains. And there was a need for people to come and volunteer to help I don't want to say save the forest, but to volunteer in terms of uh, making the forest uh, a little bit more um, safer for, for the future. And so the girls came and they were explaining to us what we had to do. But in my own mind, I thought what we would have to do is clear away all the destroyed trees from the fire, clear up the area, maybe replant some trees so that you know the forest would regrow. And to my surprise, the person who was instructing us told us, do not touch anything that you see of destruction. What we are going to be doing is we are going to be uh, constructing these walls so that if, God forbid, there's another fire in the future, the walls will prevent the fire from spreading. And I was thinking, well, how is that helpful? We have to remove the destruction so that we can make way to plant the new trees. And what he explained was fascinating and something that I felt was very inspiring. He said, in the midst of the forest fire, there's a lot of wind that's going on. Part of the reason why the fire spreads so fast, there's a fire, the winds are blowing, things are dry, the fire goes all over the place and it burns the fire. But because of those high winds, as the trees are blowing, the seeds that are growing on the trees actually fall and get implanted into the ground. In the midst of destruction, of the replanting for the future of the forest to regenerify itself, to, to regrow itself. And he said, we don't mess with nature. We don't mess with the idea that it already almost the refu of the Fehamaka, that it already implanted for the future forest to grow. We nurture that, we just try as, as best as we can to prevent certain things from spreading. And so our work there was to really just create these walls so that God forbid if a fire were to happen again, it would be prevented, but that the forest itself heals itself. And I felt that that was such a powerful message that so much of our lives sometimes when we're going through so much tragedy and pain and anguish, that sometimes we're not even aware of it, but the winds in which are blowing us one way or another in our pain and anguish, sometimes are those same things that are planting the seeds for our Yeshua, for our salvation, for our happiness once again. I would be here forever if I started to recount the unbelievable strength that we've seen in this past year from Am Yisrael. Amidst so much suffering and so much pain, I'm, I'm, but when I think I can't be, you know, shocked by, by the amount of strength I see in Amistral, I meet someone new or I hear a new story, and I, I just have to scream out, Mika, I'm like Israel. How is it possible that Rachel Pullen Goldberg made her son Hirsch return home soon? sends the message to the world that hope is mandatory. A woman who is suffering like she is, is teaching the world that we need to have hope. How is it possible 
that women whose sons are held captive in Gaza are creating tefillin projects. I just saw this in the Aish video that they put out for Tisha B'Av. Unbelievable initiative of those who have been um, taken captive. Their families have given their tefillin and they've been rented out by other members of Am Yisrael who have never put on tefillin. They sign a contract saying that they will put on this pair of tefillin every single day until, until the, the people who own this tefillin come back and then they will return them to them. How is it possible that women whose husbands are off fighting are taking care of multiple children by themselves who have the strength to, to, to give a, a warm word to their friends and support. Like I said, I can be here forever and the list goes on and on and on. And it's an incredible thing to see, an incredible thing to experience. And it's just almost part of the spiritual DNA of our people. And I think this Kina really understands that. This Kina understands that Elitzion Be'arei Kamo Isha B'Tzarei, even though we're in so much pain, we're in so much anguish, what gives us that strength to keep going? What is it? Is because we as the mother, we know that just in a few moments we'll have that precious baby in our hand. And perhaps, Baruch Hashem, I cannot understand the strength of some of the people in Am Yisrael because of the unbelievable strength that they show amidst adversity, but I perhaps can begin to make sense of why they have so much strength because they know that their story is not the end. Their story is only planting the seeds for the gula. They know that amidst their anguish, amidst their suffering, that they can instill hope to move Am Yisrael forward to the goals in which we want to reach. And it is, it's incredible, all these people, the amount of inspiration they give us to continue to strengthen our Torah learning, to continue to strengthen our mitzvot, to continue to strengthen our, our benevim chavero, our love of Eretz Yisrael. I mean, again, the stories are endless and endless and endless, but I think every single one of these people, and I think deep within each one of us, we all know that this isn't the end, just the suffering and just the anguish. We're working towards the gula. we're working towards that birth, that ability to say it was all part of the process in order to get what it is that we wanted. And so they push through and they push and they push harder. And then every generation, we're, we're shocked by how much strength is, is found. And we only ask that Hashem, we've proven ourselves enough Time, time for you to say, Mikam Chay Yisrael, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with you, Am Yisrael. So many millennia of suffering, and yet you push through, you raise your children to continue in Torah and mitzvot. You live here in Eretz Yisrael and you sacrifice so much, whether it's fighting, whether it's volunteering, whatever it is. And so we say, and every stanza to remind us that as we go through each stanza, depicting the horrors in which we've gone through, ultimately, we know that this is all part of planting those seeds for Gula. Please join me as well as singing this uh, this um, kina. Um, everyone can do what's comfortable, but it is customary to uh, to rise as we sing it, as we transition, um, not yet at Chatzos, but definitely approaching there uh, within the next hour or so. Um, so symbolically, we rise with strength, with hope, and we sing this song um, of Elitio. Elitio be'areva kemolisha b'tzireha Reviv to laugh ha'guratza Alma ne'ureva Alei arbon asher nutash Liyat shatzon ha'davarecha Oh, 
شعر شوفه که ما می میاره بیسیام آره که ما شب سیره کیم تو آت دور است هم آمیلونم
Ready? Uh, maybe seat it. Um, this is something that is uh, new. Um, I know that, uh, and, and feel free, obviously, you have the packet. Um, there is um, the Kina of the Hakto Shem Shalchorban Europa that you can say, and any of the other keynotes here in the packet that you want to say uh, that we weren't able to get to this morning. Um, but there's something that I think is a really interesting um, concept that uh, I even challenge everyone here to even consider maybe partaking in, um, which is that after going through what we've done through this past year of October 7th and beyond, um, this this Tisha B'Av was going to feel different than most Tisha B'Avs that we've felt in the past. Um, it hits closer to home in ways, um, unfortunately, uh, that uh, we didn't think that we would be relating to. I even found myself, as we were reading some of the earlier keynotes uh, that Leah and uh, Sharona were talking about, talking about the time of the Beit HaMikdash and the Crusades. In previous years, some of the language, some of the descriptions um, are horrific, but they didn't resonate with me in a, in a personal way. And going through some of these earlier kinos, it's hard not to draw certain parallels or certain type of feelings of what we've gone through uh, this past year. Um, in uh, the Hamizrafi magazine, uh, there is a wonderful introduction uh, to the kina uh, that was written by Karav Yosef Svi Rimon, which uh, the uh, copy of the kina um, is separate from the packet. Um, and Rabbi J.J. Shafter speaks about historically how this is something that has been going on throughout the many centuries. Um, as mentioned, we have a kina on the Crusades. Obviously, many of the keynotes that we read are based on the Chorba by Rishon. And so, you know, from the first, uh, from the first Tisha B'Av that we expect, experienced nationally with destruction and Chorban um, throughout the years, even 650 years later when the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed and uh, we have certain keynotes that we talk about um, that, uh, that were written at a later date uh, to be recited on Tisha B'Av commemorating the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, and as we saw, the first Crusades, as well as um, communities um, of spire and worms uh, that were destroyed, um, Sifre Kodesh that were burnt in Paris, all find themselves um, here in this packet that, that we have, or the Ashkenazi custom at least, to recite many of these keynotes because of the various different calamities that we've gone through. And uh, Rabbi J.J. Shachar talks about how specifically when the Shoah um, took place, obviously then at that moment, for many of the people experiencing the unimaginable horrors there, um, Tisha B'Av meant something very different when, you know, once the war was over and Tisha B'Av came around, it was the loss and the experiences that they had in the Shoah that were resonating with them more so than talking about the Crusades and talking about the second Beit HaMikdash or the first Beit HaMikdash. And so there were many who were inspired to write uh, and there were many who were inspired to um, try to capture some of the pain and to perhaps provide a little Nechama as well. Um, and so I definitely uh, will not do justice, but I definitely um, draw your attention to the article written by Rabbi J.J. Shafter on this. I just bring it as a point of introduction um, that this is something that um, has a uh, significant misora of writing one's own kina, of having experienced something in their generation, and that they want to remember in a way that is um, uh, inspiring or perhaps um, comforting um, for, for, for each person um, and, and what they're going through. Um, I'd also like to just mention, um, if possible, um, that um, last night my uh, my husband was watching Khan 11, uh, the national uh, broadcast there, and um, what's interesting is he actually felt very moved by what he saw on, you know, national TV, I guess, 
for us Americans, it would be the equivalent of watching this take place on CNN. Um, and so what happens, he wrote that on Khan 11 tonight, Israel's national broadcaster, journalist Yair Weinram, just interviewed Yagel Kharoush, who wrote a kina about Beiri. How do you write a kina, asked Yair. I feel like reality itself was writing the kina, responded Yagel. Beiri, Kisufim, Nachaloz, as well as these being the concrete places, all these words reach deep into the Jewish tradition. Be'er is one of the mystical ways of referring to the Shechina, and the concept of the breaking of the Be'er Mayim is deeply resonant. When asked about the structure of the Kina, Yigal said that in it, traditionally, the last verse of the Kina is one of comfort. The eye that has been cleansed with tears is more able to find the sprouts of comfort. As well as the profound content, I take great comfort knowing that Israel's national broadcaster is sharing such deep, meaningful religious messages of comfort. The whole country has experienced such national pain, and on Tisha B'Av, there is a sense of turning to Jewish tradition to frame that pain and to find comfort. And I thought that that was something that was quite remarkable, that not only Harav Yosef Tzvi Ramon um, felt the need that this Tisha B'Av, something had to be done a little bit differently to capture that which we've experienced this past year, the many of our brothers and sisters throughout er Eretz Yisrael um, felt the need to capture what they felt was, was their kina. And so it was shared and broadcasted on uh, national TV last night, uh, the uh, kina of Beiri. I'm sure if you uh, look online, you can find the, the words. It was also, I think, perhaps put to a tune. And um, one of the interesting things that perhaps I'll challenge everyone here is that I'm sure every single one of us could write our own kina, all of our various experiences um, after October 7th. Uh, perhaps there are personal things that each of us go through throughout the year. Um, and maybe it's not a bad practice that uh, at some point throughout Tisha B'Av, we sit down with a pen and paper and we just let the words that are in our hearts and our souls kind of write themselves. Um, and it's not something that we need to share. It's not something that we have to put into a packet for the nation to say. But perhaps for us, even in a way of capturing the pain that we've gone through and even writing ourselves words of comfort um, is something that is truly remarkable. Um, so I draw your attention to Harav Yosef Tzvi Rimon. Um, Maybe just uh, as I'll just make one last concluding point uh, for you to be able to look over uh, the words. Uh, it's quite powerful, um, and I know that the first time I read it, I was uh, I was brought to tears. And um, and I'll just make one mention that of an interesting conversation within my family um, after we had talked about uh, what my husband shared in terms of you know feeling wow you know the uh, national broadcaster. Had, Israel put out this uh, Kina and Beiri um, that was written by Gal. Um, I have a sister-in-law who, in discussion, you know, talked about the idea of many of the Kinos that have been written um, have been written after a number of years after the events. And so she asked in a, in a very genuine way, do you think that writing Kinos um, in the midst of what we're still going through, it's not over. We still have hostages, we still have people fighting, uh, we have a looming threat of our enemies who wish to destroy us. Is it too soon to maybe do this reflective exercise of writing a kina uh, of what happened? And in the discussion, one of the things that I think um, is captured here by uh, Rev. Ramon, um, specifically in his kina, is that uh, it's been a very long time, it's been a very long war and experience and uh, there's been various different parts. Um, and I think that although we're not at the end of it, and uh, the end of it, that really will be Yeshua, Nechama, Deula, but, um, but I think that at different stages of what we can reflect on um, deserve words of, of writing or Nechama. And I think that uh, Rav Ramon does an amazing job of capturing so much of what many of us have felt, even if many years haven't passed where we have the you know, um, ability to look back and retrospect, 
but even in the raw moments uh, within the year itself of it happening, uh, to have um, written something like this, where it really um, allows us to, to think and remember um, and to relate, um, I think is significant in and of itself, but an interesting conversation nonetheless to continue perhaps with your families um, at home and to, like I said, perhaps challenge ourselves to even write our own keynote this year um, in a way of expressing that which we've gone through nationally, personally. Um, and so with that, we will uh, recite Rav Ramon's kina. Um, it is also to the tune of Elitzion. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, sing it again. And uh, feel free to join me in Hebrew uh, if you want to follow along in the English whatever makes this keynote more meaningful for you. Um, and as we conclude it, um, I just want to um, end with a dvar, I don't know, bracha or, or nechama, that uh, this should be our last time that we gather um, on Tisha B'Av mourning, Korban, mourning the destruction that has taken place throughout the many centuries of Jewish history, um, but that we remember moving forward, the amazing Yeshuot, Nechamot, um, and Gulot um, that are yet to uh, unfold themselves. Please God, protecting Am Yisrael and uh, moving us towards the Gula Shlema. All right, so let's uh, let's start um, again with the tune of Elitzio. Simcha Torah Shmini Atzeret Natah Nacholeina Letuva Poderet Biyom Zeh Nifar Tuk Zerot Yishuve Haotepak Kim Yusterot Echa Artseinu Haita Lemar Mas Betimalei Haaret Hamas Nerutat Azal Mekor Harasha Mishoresh Hamas Yatsa Sepa Echa Vemakom Sheva Hakapot Masua Anashan Imat Hatifot O Eva Zarai Mitzit Reko Rotseach Mashpia Berlina Hakot Echa Vemakom Tfilat Hageshen Yara Dodi Arbot Habosem Shoshani mitvachim chilu vashem, namarts im hachitin yad vashem, echa beshnat shivim beshesh, timrot tashan vedam baesh, yevidi vachbo nechara velochesh, tachad oneg shabbat kodesh, echa beneg zion haikarim, Nachlu biyede amasim arurin Merute lachi netnu yinim amakim Achim chatufim biyede chamasim Yom lo shemcha hitcha Halel lo chamin Naku shemcha legadya Habetu re'ei mika amcha Yisrael Haskeinu v'amseinu v'atatsiyam goel Kibarzel v'achamu v'mitzut amsim o'avim Adinei nechash miyatsan maginit Bigurtam ra'inu t'shuot olamim Nizkakat kenotinu dor gilim Biyom v'o nizman achlatinu Kutra lechersum giburat ha'aminu Nafsham v'chapan musrim giburinu Avinu malkinu nikmat nikmat ha'chinu Al shimcha ha'gadol nikrashiminu Zohar maskir b'rit avotinu Mitachon mitharon omdim v'chalotinu V'briyat ha'omedet lanu v'yartsinu Haritziparas hazamu alilot, matchim shachu leno setri lot, tzfonim yashru veinayim yachalot, et nisachara unorati hilot, kanfei ruach, kanfei nishamim, ra'u ra'inu ra'ot hayamim, 
Thank you, Miriam. Um, okay, so we're going to take a 10 minute break um, and then we'll have this year from Rav Khan. Anybody that wants to move up closer is welcome to do so. There are source sheets outside. Um, and just uh, keep your phones off, please. Uh, the people on the Zoom should remain on and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Every year it's difficult to speak on Tisha B'Av. And there's some years that it's harder. This year I actually couldn't imagine that I was going to speak. And then again, I don't know how we don't speak, but I just couldn't imagine. And, and actually this reticence went back to a couple of weeks after October 7th, when one of the places where I teach occasionally asked a number of the staff if they can speak about the events. And I said, what can I say? I, I, I have explanations, I have answers, theology, and I'm going to explain things. And I, I felt a complete sense of inaccuracy, inaccuracy of being able to articulate, to say something, to put thoughts or sentences together. And to a very great extent, I still feel that way. So then you may then say, so then why am I speaking? So I could say, because, you know, I guess we have a chazaka at this point, right? The, the, the chazaka is not what you think. The chazaka is this is the third different building of Makam that I've spoken in. <laughs> so that, that, that should tell at least some of the people how long it's, it's been. So the first thing that I came up with when I was asked was the title. That was before I knew what I was going to say. And especially with this part, one day the angels came and Satan also came with them. So this appearance of satanic forces, this appearance of somehow God presiding over a meeting of, uh, of angels, but somehow Satan entering and let's be honest, having his way, that was my starting point. So with that as an introduction, let's let's go in, let's start, let's read, let's learn, and let's see where we get to. In the Shulchan Aruch, which is echoing the Gemara, it tells us about certain things that should not be done on Tisha B'Av. So a lot of them, we've already had a head start from Shabbat Sabatamas, through Rosh Chodesh, or Shachalbo. Tisha B'Av Asor, B'Kitzah, B'Sichah, Nudrach, U'Milat HaSandal, B'Tash Mishabita. So we're told among all the other things we can't do is we can't study Torah because what Torah does is a Torah. It makes us happy. The verse before this says, Torah Tashem to Mima Mishiva Nafesh, Edu Tashem Namana, Achima Peti. And I feel bad for all the people who have had Jewish education who look at this verse and look at this law, look at this halakha, and it doesn't resonate with them. And they say, well, learning Torah makes me happy. And I would love to believe that the people who are in this room are the people. They're here for a reason, because Torah does make us happy. So then we have an interesting tightrope to walk. That on the one hand, that we are going to be involved in Torah sources, 
On the other hand, we have to try to make sure that it's not going to be the type that's going to make us happy. And, and the halakha gives us a very simple way to go about this. He continues and says, He continues and says, but you can't study, and here is the main place that one can enter, the main book that one can open, and that is the book of Eov. And in order to understand this, we're going to have to delve a little bit, and we're not going to study, I'm going to leave you plenty of questions to deal with, and plenty of things to think about, and plenty of chapters for you to read. But at least we'll, we'll start. Source number two, we have the beginning. It was a man who lived the way that the, he, the translations translate in the land of Oz. And by the way, it's not an accident. And his name was Eel. And this man was Tam, the Ashar, the Uralikim, the Sarmira. This man was perfect and he he was up, he did the right things. I some tree, English translation here, if you if you really want it. He was wholehearted and upright, and one that feared God and shunned evil. And, and the question then is, what else could you possibly expect from someone? And I do have an answer to that question, but I'm not going to answer it yet. And we're told in Pesach Bet that he had seven sons and three daughters, which is, by the way, Kabbalistically, those are very interesting numbers. And he had 7,000 sons. Another 3,000 Malim and 500 and 500. And all these numbers are beautiful numbers, which again, all of them are Kabbalistic significant. And this man was greater than all the people, either B'nai Kedem could be antiquity or it could be a place. So here we have Eo, who is this man of importance, and we have his children, who are children of an important man. And what do they do? They drink. I mean, literally, that's what the word Mishtem means. They drink. They drink together, which, by the way, is far better than drinking alone. Hopefully none of you know this. It, and not only they drink together, they drink together as a family, and the sons invite the daughters, and they're together, and there's unity, and there's something really, really right about that. I mean, unity is right. What they may be doing, I, I don't know how to comment. But apparently, Eo had his concerns. So right there, and Eo won four parents, or grandparents, and have concerns about the younger people and what they're doing and how frivolous they may be and how they're spending their time doing things which, you know, makes them happy. And by the way, some people stop right there. It makes them happy and maybe that's enough. But it continues and it says, so it's such an interesting relationship. His kids party, and he prays. He goes to shul, and they go to a rave. We have over here an absolute generational separation the old religious father or grandfather who does all the religious Jewish kinds of things. And the younger generation who doesn't necessarily connect to the things which the older generation is doing and is concerned in his heart and he doesn't really know if they're doing anything wrong and he has his concerns, he's worried, he has anxiety. But he goes about doing what he does and they go out doing what they do. And we have our disconnect. And right here, this would have been an interesting story just because of that dynamic, which is described over here. But it's at this point that things get worse. 
And it gets so bad, and I don't know what to say about this, because again, here is where we have our problem. The story itself is horrific. And now you'll say, how can I call a biblical story horrific? There are horrific biblical stories. And I use the word horrific because it's a horror. It's, it's frightening. On the one hand, we're told he's a righteous man, unparalleled, unequal. And he worries about his kids. And you know what? That's okay. We're allowed to worry about our kids. We're allowed to, we're allowed to pray for them. Recently, the chazan, by the minion I go to, Mincha and Mariv, said to me, he noticed something. He says, you always doubt Mincha longer than Mariv, and he says, you must be doing it because it's too early to doubt in Mariv. So that was partially true. But in Mincha, I add things in Shema Kolenu, and by Mariv, I don't because it's ready the end of Davi, and people are leaving afterwards. After Mincha, they're not leaving. They're waiting for Mariv. So I add in, and I add in things about my kids, and I add in my concerns, and I add in prayers, which I think I need to say. And I pray for my children, I pray for my students. If any of you consider yourselves my students, you should know, I pray for you to lean there every single day. And, and that's part of the prayers that come out, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's okay, that's what we do, that's who we are. But it's what happens next is where we're completely confounded, and that goes back to the title that we had used. And the day came that all the B'nai Elohim, which will translate as angels, because we have enough problems today without getting into that. The angels will come and they congregate around and they come to somehow be in the presence of God. And among all the others, lo and behold, who is there? The Satan. Now, we have to be a little careful about the Satan because we have no idea who he is, what he is, how this works, what the dynamic is. I mean, part of the issues, and we're going to come back to this, part of the issues of monotheism is that God is in charge. There's no one else in charge. What exactly, therefore, is the role of the B'nai Elohim on the one hand, or the role of a Satan on the other hand, is something which we don't even begin to imagine to understand what we're being told here. But nonetheless, the gathering takes place. And God says to Satan, now I don't even understand why God needs to ask the question. He's been going around with Alechba, did you, did you notice my servant Eel? So all those things that were told about Eel from the beginning, God attests to it. And that's pretty good. I'm going to go back again and say, so what else would we expect of someone? And then what happens next probably inspired all the Faustian tales and movies and so on, which we're quite familiar with. But it never happens quite like this, where God gets involved in some kind of deal with the devil. That's something which we don't even begin to understand. And the Satan answers and says, come on, here is a man who truly is a great man, because everything about how his life is wonderful. What would happen if his life were, I'll be nice now, imperfect? Which means there are certain people in this world whose challenge in life is to serve God with incredible wealth. And by the way, very often we see that God shows the right people because they know what they're doing. They take responsibility, they do it the right way, and God should bless them and give them a lot more wealth and let them continue. Sometimes people are tested with poverty. That's also a test. In a sense, what the Satan was saying, sure, Eo's okay when everything's going his way, but start taking things away from him and let's see how he does. You know, of course, 
none of this should happen because this is God. Nothing needs to be proven when you're God. And nonetheless, what then goes on happens, again, fairly quickly in the text, but Tommy gets the first chapter. Eov is absolutely devastated. Again, I'm not going to be precise. He loses his wealth and he loses his health. And then, like the scene out of The Wizard of Oz, a house picks up in a wind and lands on his children and kills His wife tells him to curse this God that he serves. His friends are going to come and tell him. Well, we'll get to his friends in a second. We don't understand the story. We don't understand how a wager, as it were, maybe I'm exaggerating, could take place in the celestial sphere and then have a good, good, upright, decent man being gutted in the terrestrial sphere. None of that makes any kinds of sense to us. And again, I can go back to events more recently the old pious man who goes off to his shul on Simpa's tour in the morning, only to hear reports afterwards. The kids enjoying themselves in their way without any kind of judgment whatsoever, where terrible things happen. And we realize that this biblical story from a long time ago of suffering is not as theoretical as we would like it to be. And we realize that this biblical story is a good, decent man, nonetheless having around him devastation and death, is something which is unfortunately real. Eo is a survivor with his pain, and perhaps his guilt, and his questions. But somehow he retains his faith. That itself is incredibly important. And even when we have all the questions in the world, to see that he retains his faith tells us something about the greatness of his spirit. And again, there are certain people that we're told to never to judge unless we're in their place, and there are certain places that we never want to be. Eo remains faithful. In source number three, when his friends come and his friends come and they are, they're shocked, they don't recognize him, could this be ill, what has happened to him? They cry, they tear their clothing. But then as the story continues, they make an assumption, and that assumption is that God is just. And we like that assumption. And if God is just, then necessarily it means that he is a sinner. And I'm not, and, and here's the point, I'm not going through the next 30, 40 chapters with you. But that's the assumption that they're working with. And I'm conflating the lot. But essentially, Eo is encouraged to confess his sins, change his ways become a good, decent person. Because obviously, if you put together the formula, God is right, Eo is wrong, Eo is sin, Eo is a sinner, Eo needs to confess, because Eo, the fact that he's suffering, means that there's something wrong. And by the way, I want to be very careful about this. That whole presumption in Jewish theology is not true. If it were, then every time we see a poor person who needs help, we should say, obviously, God is punishing you, and who am I to go against God's will? And in our world, when we see somebody suffering, it's our responsibility to reach out a hand, to be empathetic, to help them in any way that we can. And quite the opposite, we're told, it's an interesting discussion in the Gemara of Baba Batra between Rabbi Kiva and Romi. And the Roman says to Rabbi Kiva that because you Jews give charity, you're all going to hell. 
because God has decreed that this person be poor. And who, by the way, very much coming from a system of different levels of society. How can you help somebody who's so downtrodden? What right do you have to help them? And Rabbi Kiba's response is quite the opposite. It is our helping people which is going to bring us to heaven. So again, I'm just stating that this theology that somebody's suffering therefore means there's a correlation with sin is problematic. And every time, unfortunately, a rabbi will get up and something happens and they'll point an accuser finger in some direction. There is an expression there of something which goes absolutely against Jewish theology. I will admit that when something happens individually, that we have a responsibility of introspection. But my introspection is not someone else's accusations. There's a very big difference between somebody else saying, this is what you've done wrong, as opposed to somebody saying, I feel that something has happened here, I need to improve. And by the way, just because you find something to improve, it doesn't mean that that's the thing that God had in mind. I'm just going to point out that somehow God works for rabbis who have a particular agenda, and then anything that happens is evidence of that agenda being fulfilled. So let's just be honest a little bit. Nonetheless, that seems to be the approach that these friends of Eo are taking. And as I said, I'm skipping a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of chapters. We've moved to source number four, ready by chapter 38. And it's at this point that God responds description, mina sa'ara. Sa'ara is wonderful, the whirlwind, but it also means to us for when something is, is, is very shaken up. And God responds and he says, and who are these people giving advice when they have absolutely no understanding? Isn't that the devil? We'll skip a little bit. Eight for a yita, the as they are at a giving a data bina. Were you there when creation took place? Were you there when God created the cosmos? Were you there when God created this planet? Misa mi madeha kite da umina ta aleta. Who was the one who was there measuring how God was behaving when creation took place? Essentially, what God is saying is really the ultimate argument of leverage. You know very little. You know very little. You're extremely limited. And from your limited perspective, you'd be able to ask, so how is, I don't like the way God runs the world. You know nothing about God, and you know nothing about the world. All that you see is the little bit that God has revealed to you. And from the little bit that God revealed to you, the little bit that you understand. And from that little bit that you understand, that you actually understood correctly. So let's be honest for a minute. And that's essentially what God is saying, is that this is an absolute absurdity for these people to have already decided that they understand exactly what's going on. By the way, none of this helps us all that much. And, and I'm also going to be honest with you. Today's Tisha B'Av. Today is not the day to try to get to proper types of, uh, of explanations or solutions or explaining how the world works. It's okay to have a day of conflict, of inner conflict. It's okay to have a day of inner turmoil. That's fine. I'm not as concerned today about resolutions as much as the process which we think, I think we need to go through. Source number five will either help us or not. We have two contradictory opinions about EO. One is, if you read all the opinions, I say two contradictory, one, two types. One type is a whole bunch of articulations to it, and that is when EO lived. And it says, EO be meosha. But another one says, be meyosha. Another one says, be meyosha. Another one says that be may amaratman. Another one says, and keep on going because there's lots and lots. Be may shvot shavshotim, be may achash verosh, be may david, be may kazdim, and so on. Be may dina, yakov. You're going to find eel lives in every generation. And you know what? It is really true. Because there really is, in a sense, an eel who lives in every generation. When Mary inherits, lost her seconds. Now, Mary is a neighbor of ours. When Miriam lost her second son, she did not want to open the doors, and she said, I built like Eo. 
I knew the knocking. I knew what it was. I've been there before, and I did not want to open the door. There are eels in every generation. But then again, we have this other opinion, and that is in this second line. Yatiba whom you are abundant to make your Shmuel bar money. And I love that it's an anonymous opinion. Some rabbis said in front of Shmuel bar money, the Yatiba Amar, they sat and they said, Eov lo hoya believe. Eov never existed. There never was an Eov. El Mashalim. The whole story is a parable. The whole story is here to teach us a lesson because there never was a man named Eov. So here, again, I said, I love the two contradictory opinions. He never lived, and he never lived in every generation. That's our takeaway of this. But then we also have in source number six, a source which is essentially going to tell us, and by the way, these are, this is one page after the other in Bhagavatra, the one right after that. Anybody learning that film, you should have seen these not that long ago. The same spiritual energy creates all three of these things that we're quite frightened of. Satan, evil inclination, angel of death. It's all the same. Amrabi Levi, skipping the next paragraph. Satan and Pnina, Lashim Shemayim, Nidkapi. So this is what changes everything. It says that the Satan actually does what he does, L'shem Shemayim. He is a religiously pious entity. So we started a moment ago that Eov lived in every generation, but he doesn't exist. So now we have the Satan, who is the Malach Hamaved, right? It's the angel of death and the eight Sahara and so on, but it also doesn't exist. Because it doesn't exist as a demonic force that we thought that it was. And everything is completely different. We're told a little bit after that. Something came the Hazel of his birth with the conducted dating, but her eel of Amr has to show him in a shiny way the ref mute the opera that he said using the contemporary language. He said that God is dissing Avram with all this talk about eel. Yeah, he was a good guy, but he's not Avram. By the way, I, I want to justify this, because this will help us a lot. Eo, we're told, excels in Surmanima. We're not told that Eo did any Aseto. Avram does a great deal of Aseto as well. So here, the Satan of all, again, I don't want to say of all people, of all entities, is getting up and says, you know, it's a Macha. I protest the honor of Avram Avinu. You think this, you think Eov is so good, he's no Avraham. So like, don't even go there. So it's such an interesting comment of the Gemara, where he's saying, he's not doing this, and he he works the Shem Shemayim, and he's working over here to get to Avram. As I said, I don't know what to do with this. The last line of the Gemara here says, Dersh Ravatha Riyakov Kapunya. This Ravatha Barakha taught this in Vesel Rahunya. For Anta Satan and Satan arrived, the Nashke Akari, and he kissed his feet, which means he goes, You found me out, you figured it out, and so on. Which means the Satan likes his street cred. He likes to walk around with his reputation as being a tough guy. He wants people to be afraid, but the Satan is there in the service of God. And you go to that first scene of Beal, God invites everybody, invites the Satan as well. The Satan is an angel. Satan is one of God's angels who does some of the dirty work, which is, makes things a lot more complex. But the Satan is there in the service of God. And I'm going to repeat myself when I said before, that is one of the implications of monotheism. You can only have one God who's in charge of everything. It doesn't work any other way. In source number seven, something that we're almost familiar with, when I say almost, you'll see why it's only almost. Ani Hashem ve'en u'zulati, e'en o'lati. I'm reading the truck, which I read this way. Ani Hashem ve'en o'zulati, e'en elohim. Right, that's the better way to read it. I am God. Other than me, there's none other. There is are no other gods. I'm 
I'm God, there's no other. So now it's ready to be. Third Pesach, Pesach Zion. Yotzer Or, Uvore Choshev. Ose Shalom, Uvore Ra. And the Hashem, Ose Kol Now anybody who's a little bit surprised because you've been dominating your whole lives, now realize that in our sitter, our collective sitter, there is a cover-up. In the cover-up, it says, I'm God, right? The God, right now, it's the Rafa, Ose Shalom, Uvore Etakol. Now, Etakol is wonderful because it's this kind of paru. God creates everything, but what's included in everything? That becomes the question. And then you read the passage again, and it says, Uvore Ra, I create evil. Now, we have to be very careful about this, and this is not the time to walk out or fall asleep. You have to stay at least another minute. <clears throat> in source number eight, the Medrash Rabbah says, Amru Kanina, in Devara, your raid, Milama. Nothing bad comes down from heaven. Now, there's a little bit of a problem again. If God is in control of everything, then where does bad come from? Bad doesn't come from heaven, then how does these things happen? Because I can assure you that everyone in this room has experienced something bad. So what's the answer? I want to read that Pasuk Nishayahu a little bit more carefully. Pasuk Zayn says, Yotzer Or. Yotzer means Yitzira, it means formation. Yotzer Or means that light is formed out of some type of primordial forces. Yotzer Or. That means that there is primordial light, and the primordial light somehow helps the light that exists in this world come into existence. Uvorich, I create darkness. That means prior to creation, there was no darkness, there was only light. The light somehow is refracted, darkness is created. That means one of the prices that we pay for creation is now there's darkness. Osashon, pieces made. That means that all the pieces are there and they need to be put together properly. Uvore ra. Evil is created. That means that evil doesn't exist. That means that when we have a creation, a couple of things come into the world, darkness and evil. Now, I could spend more time that I don't want to and just say very simply that that part of the price that we pay for creation is that God gives us free will and with our free will, man from the dawn of history has been hurting other men. You want to take away all pain and suffering, take away free will, and we won't be able to hurt one or, or ourselves. And therefore, before creation is only this light and God creates us, creates us as being independent, and now there's going to be this darkness in the world as well, and there's going to be this evil as well. So as I said, I don't want to spend too much time with this, but that's part of this issue of creation. Instead, I want to move in a slightly different place because I don't want to leave the Satan by itself, and I want to come back to it. The first in source number nine, which in a certain sense already confirms with what we had seen in number six, from Rish Lakish to Satanese, I heard them all come up, and they're all the same, and they're all good. The Torah should be mayor. And by the way, with mayor's man went through a great deal of personal pain and suffering. The Tartosha of Meir Matsukatu, they found written, most likely this means on the margin, not that he had a different text. Vine Tov Ma'od, and all creation is very good. He wrote Vine Tov Ma'od, death is good. Now, for I think for most of us, that that is painful. You can hear somebody say, maybe, maybe we can soften it a bit and ask ourselves if there was no end of the road, how many of us would ever accomplish anything? which means if we always had unlimited amount of time, so maybe we live our lives differently. But let's leave that for a moment. And I want to read the next source. The next source is a long passage from the Zohar. By the way, this is not the place I lose you. I'm going to lose you right afterwards, okay? In this passion, this passion of the Zohar, which I was nice enough to translate from the Aramaic to the Hebrew, not nice enough to put it into English, because you still have to feel that you're learning to, to an extent. And it actually wants to know how we can ever serve God through a Yetzir Hara. It tells us, that we should serve God 
right? B'chol Yitzhak, right? After Shabbat B'chol Yitzhak, right? With our Yitzhak Hara and our Yitzhak Toh. And how do you serve God with your Yitzhak Hara? How does that work? And by the way, there are probably many possible answers to that question. But listen to this passage, which is amazing. How can you love God? Right? How can you love God with all of you, your good and your bad? Could something which is essentially this satan, right? Our Yetzirah is our own personal, right? Made to order, satan, leading us astray. How can we possibly come to a situation of loving it. That is really a high level of service to God. When a person forces their evil donation to balance submission and serve God, there is something profound taking place. When you break it, and here's where the secret will now be revealed. Everything that God does above and below, everything is to reveal God's glory. And everything is to serve God. But how could it possibly be that there is a servant, by the way, read him now, Satan, who is working against, and you're telling me it's working for him. How could this possibly be? But the Yetzirah is there telling us on every single step of the way how we shouldn't do it, but don't do it now, or do it in a different way, or whatever it may be, but the end result is it takes us away from the service of God. God has a bigger picture concern here. Just wait, I'm not literally translating. I'm going to skip a little bit over here, and you can be, it just makes the question a little bit stronger, and you can all read on when you have time. Couple lines before the end, he said, certainly this Satan or this Yitzhara is in the service of God. Lamelech, and saying, this is a parable. So our first parable today was Eov, and now our second parable. Lamelech, Shirlo Ben Yechidi. He was once a king who had an only son, the Yohebel Tov Yoter, and he loved him exceedingly. Vitziva, a love, ba'ava shalo, yakrivet atzmoli shara, shalo yakrivet atzmoli shara. And he told him, stay away from wayward women. Okay, so this is advice going back at least to the Zohar, I suspect before that as well. He no longer enter into the king's palace. And the son agreed. So let's embellish this ever so slightly. Once upon a time, we had a king. Who is the king in Zohar stories? God. Once upon a time, God had a son, an only son he loved. And let's say it's mankind. I'm happy to be universe. And he says to mankind, I'm going to create you. Your soul comes from within this palace, and I'm going to send you away from the palace. Because it's easy to follow God when you're in the palace, but let's see how you follow the king when you're in the palace. But what happens when you're outside of the palace? And here's the rule I'm giving you. Don't do, and he gives him some things not to do. And then the prince goes wandering out of the palace into the countryside, completely convinced that he's going to be victorious, and he's going to go back to the palace having done one, you know, any temptation, he's going to walk away from it. Why? Because the stakes are too high. The price is too high. He loves the king, and he loves the palace, and he wants to go back, and being the son of the king, he's got the king's DNA, he has the cell in the lokin, and he wants to go back, and his soul is perfect. He's full of purity, and everything is great except for what God does next. Sorry. The king. The king had a servant. I'm going to call her a servant. She lives outside. 
actually calls her a prostitute. And not only that, it says that she's really hot. Sorry, is there a better way of saying this? She's exceedingly attractive. Leonin, Amar Hamela, Fanny wrote, Sell her oath that it's an Osho Bini Eli. I want to see how dedicated my son is to me. Karala tells an Avamar La Lafi Utifati at Bini. He says, Please go and seduce my son. By the way, this story is told over in various Hasidic sources. And they say something which is impossible in terms of theology, but once you're dealing with uh, metaphor, you, you can extend it. They say that the first woman that he goes over to, again, this is God talking to the, a, a, a satan as it were, says, absolutely not. I could not do a thing like that. I can't seduce the king's son. And the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, in the sense, all these angels refuse to do this because this is just wrong. But, but as I said, the Zohar doesn't have that complexity. He goes over to this woman, and he says, I want you to seduce. Now, I, I just want you to think a second. If she is indeed a servant of the king, what does she want? So you have to pause there and let me answer quickly. What does she want? She's a servant of the king. She wants what the king wants. But what does she want? She wants to do what the king told her to do. So now there's two conflicting issues. One issue is what the king wants, and the other is what the king really wants. What the king wants is her, for her to go and create this alternative possibility, this seduction. And on the other hand, what does the king want? The king wants her to be turned down and for the son to walk away and say, I don't do things like that. I can't do things like that. I want to go back to the palace one day. And that's our story. So now, again, we can end the story in various ways. If it was before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I would end it one way. Yeah, you do know that, right? And that would be that, that he is tempted and that he sins and he spends the night and he spends the night with her. And then when the early morning sun comes in and hits the pillow, he sees her makeup all over the pillow. And now he sees her without all the makeup on. And he says, oh my God, it's a servant of the king. Which means at some point we realize the things that seduced us were actually situations which God created. And then he wakes up and he runs to Mikvah and he runs to, and he does Chidva. Which means the realization that God created that temptation for us is quite important. You want a happy ending to the story. He looks at her and says, absolutely not. Whether he recognizes that this is from God or not. Which means as we continue the story, if he's really sophisticated, what will he then understand? Well, they understand that this is an alternative possibility, but it's not a possibility. It's an alternative and it's tempting, but it's not a possibility. It's just not part of the world's possibility. And a matter of fact, he can then realize something else, that because he has turned down this situation, which was somewhat tempting because we decided that she was hot, attractive, then, then his... He will have appreciation for her because the more tempting she is, the better job that she does, the more the satan is satan-like. Are you with me on this? I told you this was the easy part. The more the satan is satan-like, the more we can love the satan for creating a great illusion. A great, you know, that was really great. Okay. Anybody who does any acting, somebody comes over. That was great. You looked in part. You looked exactly. You had me fooled there for a second, but not for more than a second. I know exactly what was really going on. Did that make sense? And that's the next couple lines over here. The, oh, the next line. The Oto is on now. Yesh possess Sheba for low, but I yesh la Sheba. We call it sudden. And Fanshe has gotten to its own amela. One, functionally, she did what the king commanded her. He brought to fruition the inner values of the prince to show that he really does follow what the king has ordered in the way that he was brought up, which means the withstanding of temptation leaves us with a situation where we should love the temptation for having created the possibility for both God and for us to now know where we really stand. And I'll say again, more or less, that's what it says. And he continues now, trying up almost everything we've seen to now, till now. Having this other possibility. And 
So where have we gotten now? So Eov never existed, and then Satan never existed, and who else never existed? But 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 we have a problem. What's the problem? The problem that is every single one of us has experienced pain. And the problem also is the continuation story of Eov. The end of Eov is what really should be bothering us. It's in source 11. Then he talks to the other friends and tells them, you know, you guys did not do a good, a good job. Kilo de Barton and then the Funa cut the heel. Heel was okay, you guys are not okay. And he gives them things to do. And afterwards it says in Pasifet, the heel of Avdi and Palel Alechem. And heel of my servant will pray for you. By the way, that may, I know he prayed till now, but he only prayed for his own flesh and blood. He only prayed for his own children. Now, I'm not salvation grace. Now, at the end of the story, he prays for others as well. And that may be part of a change that takes place in Eo, now becoming an Aseto as well. But what really bothers me is not that. What really bothers me is as we continue in the story and we get to the very end, it says, Pasikir Ben, or even before the Pasikir, Vashem Shav et Shut Eo et Paloba Andreeu, Vayosef Hashem et Polashem et Eo Vemeshim. And God doubled everything that Eo had in the beginning, which means he now had twice as much money as he had before. And then he continues and it says in Pasukim Bet, the Shembi Rafik Atharithi, Eo Marishito, he blessed, and he gives us the numbers of all the things. The Yilo Shiva, Anna, Banim, Vishalosh Banot. This question that means double or not double. He has new children, and these children and the girls are beautiful, attractive. The Yikra, Shem, Ahatat Yemima, the Shem Ashmit. So the end of the story, which again ends great, he gets new kids, everybody's happy, you live happily ever after, except for one problem. And the problem is, what about the nightmares? What about the fear? What are the scars? What about the fear that it can happen again? This doesn't happen in real life that somebody loses a child and has another child, okay, everything worked out okay. Live happily ever after. It doesn't work that way. This is not a real story. This can't be a real story. You can't just take pain and say, oh, it all worked out okay. That's not the world that we live in. And it's at this point, I told you, it's now that I start to lose you. I want to bring in a teaching, and it's going to be a little bit complicated. And I'm just going to show you the complicated line, and I'm not going to explain it sufficiently. And then I'll show you somebody quoting it and somebody else quoting it until we're going to keep on bringing it down and down and down and down to earth until it becomes something that makes sense for us. In source number 12, which is the writings of the Arizal, essentially he's talking about two different models. I'm not sure if you're going to notice them both. But one of the two models of existence. One is a linear model where time goes in a certain flow. There's a beginning, there's a middle, we move on in time. And then there's some type of a cyclical model where things walk, work in some type of a circle. Now, I think our minds worked a little bit better with the linear model. We were young, then we got older, and then we got old, but we didn't realize we were old until, well, we thought we were old, and now we got even older. And, and there's a line. There's an absolute line that we live. That's our experience. But stop for a moment and think. Every Shabbat has the same happiness. Every week, there's a cycle, and we go back to the same ship. Every year, we get back to the same Pesach, and every year, we get back to the same Tisha Which means there are elements of our lives which any question moves along in a path, but there's also elements in our lives which go around in a circle. And now if you'll ask me, so which one does Judaism believe in? The answer is yes which means we believe in both of those models somehow, 
and working together. And I just want to, again, I, I told you, this part is a little bit harder. The story of Eov can make sense, not in a linear model, but it could in a, in a, in a cyclical model. If somehow there's a circle over here, which is his life, then somehow here is the happy and there is the sad, but we passed the sad and now we're the happy and it's okay. It doesn't work in this other way of seeing the world. I don't know if I made any sense just now. I don't know if, I don't know if that made any sense, but let's first now look at what the Ariza does. I'm going to, for the part that it's really... Again, going back to the moment before creation, we are or elyon again, primordial light. Pashut malekol mitzim b'lo yashu makom panoi v'chinat ha'vir reikani v'chalal. Everything was light, whatever that means. It's primordial, it's spiritual, it's ethereal. Elakol yam olim in or in sof. Pashut ahu v'lo yalo v'chinat rosh v'lo v'chinat sof. There was no beginning and there was no end. Elakol haya or Elokim pashut shavah maybe or achad pashut shavah v'ashva achad v'hu anikra or insof. I'm going to skip a little bit. We may as some saying of that small to be to be a whole insof being the begat insay. It somehow got created this contraction. But some saying of or who v'nir v'nitrachik el tzadei sevibut in the begat insay. Like this picture. And in the original text, there was a picture. There are multiple opinions what that picture looks like. So I did not bring you the picture. But generally, the picture is of a circle and a dot. And you have a circle with a dot in the middle of the circle. And But it's a circle. And everything he's describing here is a circle. Another line you can see, he says that... There is something here about the circle. And again, I know it's a mystical source. I apologize. What can we do with this? In source 13, you're going to have the same thing. Somehow creation takes place by God holding back infinity, and a circle is made in source. That's source 13, source 14. The Ramchal is going to explain it a little bit more. Again, I'm stopping because you already understand there's no right, there's no left. There's no, it, all that we have is a circle. Wonderful. Good. Everything, the only thing I want you to do with that is just put it on some place of your head that at some point in your life, say, yeah, it's heard something about that made no sense whatsoever. I had no idea what he was talking about. And it's okay. And now you have it put aside. And now let's learn a little bit more. See, this life where you can have a child and God forbid lose a child and then have a child again. Again, the book of Eov is, it's cruel. And that's what bothers us. It's cruel. How can God be a party of this? It's cruel. The pain. Forget about the logical arguments. I skipped all the logical arguments. I don't care about the logical arguments. I care about the whole and the heart. That's so much more real than the logical arguments in this whole story. But there's another biblical story that tells the same story. Okay, no. And it's not mystical. And if you look at the next source, you can say, oh, because there was once a person who thought his son was dead, and suddenly his son was alive. When they told him, oh, Yosef Chai, Yosef is really still alive. But he mourned Yosef. He cried for Yosef. He turned, he tore Kriya for Yosef. To see who will shell the polar it's right. And not only that, he's in charge of all of Egypt. And Yaakov could not believe it. And as Yaakov came to this moment of realization, that Yosef was alive again, Yaakov became alive again. So somehow in this circle, Yosef was alive and then Yosef is dead, or you can all correct me and say, perceived as dead, but Yaakov was dead. There was a part of Yaakov that died, and now Yaakov comes back to life. 
There's a part of Yaakov that had those nightmares. There's a part of Yaakov that couldn't stop crying. There was a part of Yaakov that had suffered. And now Yaakov comes back to life. So I hope you understand that within this story, there is a lot more that we need to unpack. Stay with me now a couple more minutes and hopefully we'll get there. In Midrash Rabbah, in Source 16, we have Lumitz Rhyme and Dilo, Lemor Od Yosef Rai. And then it says, Bayar to Adela. And he sees, he sees the wagons. And it goes into a whole halachic discussion. The Ochen Bar Shaul, he said, Beautiful teaching with depth, with layers to it. That before they left, the last thing they learned together, the last thing they learned was about Egla Ruth. And what's Egla Ruth? About when somebody dies and who takes responsibility. And by the way, what do you do with this? You take a very careful measure and you see which city was closest. What else was this measure, which we need to pay attention to? Because those are the two types of the world that are possible. There's a line, there's a measure, or there's something which is round. We're eventually going to get to the point of circling the wagons. Okay? That's exactly what we're going to say. So the last thing that he learned was about Edla Rufa, and then he feels, and then he feels better. Very end, it says, Raf Kofel Shay Yosef Benisha, Tamat Saroti, you have done only in Sikkato, her being many Shafatati Shamanti, Mr. Rebbe Pemenishu. He said, Perhaps unlike Eo, Yaakov Avinu had questions about God. It's very interesting the way that this is formulated. There's, there's a lot more to this, believe it. In Source 17, the motions came coming from the school of Tosa. And the school of Tosa folk, believe me, they knew about pain and they knew about suffering. And if you went through the keynote this morning, you should have seen what we saw did. They lived through the Crusades. Rabbeinu Tan was lucky to have survived. He was almost killed during the Crusades. Many of the Baleotos vote and their families and students were murdered. The Moshevs came in when later the Baleotos talks about this whole idea of the Edla Rufa. And he actually asks a great question. What is one thing I'm with the other? What are you talking about? He sent wagons. He sees the wagons and Egla Ruf. And then he goes and he tries to explain this. It also could be one of Egla Ruf that, that part of the teaching is that Yaakov walked him. He was Melabel. One of the takeaways of the Egla Ruf of Persia is the midst of Levoy, that you should accompany somebody. And essentially, Yosef was saying to his father, you have no responsibility. Because by the way, when Yosef is sitting all those years alone, he could say, why would my father send my brothers who hate me? And he's turning to his father and saying, no, you have no responsibility. Right? You want to measure. This is Egla Rufa. There's no responsibility over here. Which itself is really interesting. And then Tosfot ends up, of course, in a beautiful way, and says, the Dabrafir Vayarata Agalot, the Fika Ka'ayin Tuya, the Ayin should be written in Agalot, hovering, the Mashma Vayar et Tagalut. Which, by the way, the Kos Mashayev Eretz Kanan, Loya Yuri Me Agalut, about the Shurat Agalot, Shabo, so Anzibin Agalot. Did you realize what, what the motion scheme just now did? It just now took us back into a circle. In what way did it take us to a circle? Yosef is dead, and then there's pain. Now you go around, Yosef is alive. Yosef alive, this is great. And now we're going, and going into Galut, but only going to Galut, but one day we're going to get out. Which means this whole circle of Jewish history is right there. And, it's, and he's saying that's what he's saying with the Agalot. But if this isn't sharp enough for us yet, look at Source 18, and now they'll start to make sense. Lady Yitzhak Mibadich says, by Yonar to Agalot, Ramazlo the Yaakov, Sha'al Yadad me Agalot, he calls our Siba the Gula. You can't have the Gula without the God. Ki Arabu a Siba the Toba, and the Agalot who Lashon Eagle. And this is the teaching of the Arizal that we saw. La Siba on the Quadabar Eagle, Baharafani Mapshutim, who ha or Hayashar, La Sibotina. 
which means this teaching, which again may be a little difficult for us, is this idea of this circle. And, and I want to go back to where I started today, and then I have a couple of more things to say before we're finished. So when I was asked after October 8th to speak about what happened, I told you, I have no explanations, I have no particular insight, I have no Ruach HaKodesh, God did not explain anything to me. But I did say one thing. I said that all of us are children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren of survivors, of people who experienced horrific things in life, who decided to get up and to continue on. Because this circle is Jewish history. We've had so many times that we've almost disappeared. But we are here, not in, 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 a, in some kind of a strange poetic sense. This isn't abstract. This is real. Somebody along the line, many people along the line, in our lines, decided, I'm not staying on the floor. I will not die. I'm getting up. That's who we are. Can I explain what happened? No. Can I explain why it happened? No. And come on, can we be honest? It was the single worst day in the history of the state of Israel, at least. It was a combination of every single terrible thing that happened in one day. It was every single terror attack, every single nightmare, all of them happening at once. So no. I don't have any explanations. But what I do see is a circle. And in that circle, sometimes Satan shows up. And somehow we don't understand it, that God invited him to the party. And somehow God has some kind of a chishon that we don't know. No explanations. We don't know. But keep on looking at that circle. Because once you realize there's a circle, you're going to see so much more than we realized before we saw it. Just want to end this part. I'm not finished. In source 19, the Torah Shalom of Rav Kasha brings down some sources that I mentioned about Pet before about Yaakov being upset and Yosef calming him down and said, You did accompany me. And at the very end, he says he found a manuscript in his own library in London that says, would be a Tamashiach, and, and what about Ba'agalahu was man career? Don't say Ba'agala, Ba'agalahu was man career. That you see something bad happening, but it's written, and anyone who says a Kaddish, have that in mind when you say Kaddish. Ba'agalahu was man career, that's the circle as well. And that's what he sees that he sees in this, uh, in this manuscript in the Sassan Library. Source number 20. Simchat Torah. Why are we starting with Simchat Torah now? Or are we ending with Simchat Torah? And you all know why, because that's when that's that's where this particular part of our story began. Actually, how did I begin today? I began by teaching Allah that you're not going to learn Torah on Tishaba because it brings Simcha, because you can't have Simcha Torah on Tishaba. But when can you have Simcha Torah on Sim, on Simcha Torah? So what did they do to us? They took away our Simchat Torah and they turned it into Tishka. But what is Simchat Torah about more than any other holiday? It's about that circle that I explained. I mean, just read the halakha because we all know this. Motzim Gimel, source 20, Shulchan Aruch. Motzim Gimel, Sferim and Korim Bechad, Vizot Abracha, Hatzof, Torah, Vashini, Bereshit, Adashev, Aral, Lokim, Masof. The end and the beginning. By the way, not the beginning and the end. The end and the beginning. Why? Because we exist in a circle. And what do we then do? And we go and we dance in a circle on Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is all about this circle in terms of what we're reading, in terms of what we're carrying, in terms of how we're moving, in terms of the whole essence of the day is about a circle. And then there is this teaching you bring up all the children. If you give them an aliyah, the Korman, the Parsha, Hamalach of Goel. By the way, one of the commentaries writes, Why Hamalach of Goel? Why do we read that? So that they don't have an Ayin Hala to protect the children.
in source 21 and Tehillim, it talks about how we go around in the Zbeach. In 22, the Yalkut built on that, talks about Simchat Torah, how during the days of Sukkot, we took the Arba Minim and we went around. And then um, then we put them all down. And on Chag, we go around and the and the Shazan looks like a Malach Elohim. And again, goes around the Bima, which represents the Mizbeach. In source 23, I have a relatively long quote from Rav Salvation. And I read this quote. It's, it's about half a book. I read it a long time. I knew it. It's in my head. And when I went back and I read it after I put together a lot of these sources, I realized that all the complicated Kabbalistic ones that we skipped were open in front of him as he's writing. So anything they open in front of him, it's in his mind as much as he would have had to open a book. But it's actually, and I told you that we'll take it much more down to earth. That's what he did over here. We can appreciate him circling in his bath or safer to run there by acknowledging their centrality and holiness in Jerusalem. But what is the significance of the separate Torah encircling an empty center? The answer is the center is not empty. God is symbolically there. When no one is there, someone is there. There's no place bereft of his presence. The encircling separate Torah paid homage to the divine author, acknowledging that the purpose of Torah is to direct us to God. During the house of the all marchers are equally distanced from the center, from God. One of you is a key or another, going a villain in the next, humble, who is used of stone, avoid doors of water. All have equal access to God. No doors of heaven will open before whoever devoutly knocks on its gates. God is supposed to all who call upon him and all who call upon him in truth. The Arba Minim, now you realize in the Drash you just saw. The Midrash teaches illustrate the kinship and his indispensability of all types of Jews. Just as the earth pro has taste as well as fragrance, so does too does Israel have Jews who possess learning and good deeds, scholars and community leaders. As a little of have taste, the date of the palm tree, but not fragrance. So too do we have Jews who possess scholarship, acquired for self-serving reasons, but few good deeds. Just as the Hadassim, the myrtle, have fragrance, myrtle is offered as incense, but no taste. So do those in Israel who practice good deeds but unlearned, just as the Aravot have neither taste nor fragrance, so too Israel, those who possess neither learning nor good deeds. What did God do? To those who are less than perfect, to destroy, dismiss them was impossible. Prescribed and said that all types be brought together in one band. Only then, when they are together, is a blessing appropriate. As he is equally accessible to all Jews, so should we be in the spirit of Kira. To those who, due to circumstances, fallen out of the Hakafot circling, the altar, it their self righteousness and indifference to the plight of those going their own ways indefensible. Only when all are bound together in a spirit of mutual concern is it a blessing for the Jewish people. And what he what is written here, I can assure you, was said over 50 years ago. And it's not that it's less true today. The ethics of withdrawal. When we circle, we simultaneously are drawn to the center, even as we maintain our steady distance. Our journey forward is not important but it is deflected and inclined by a magnetic pull and deference to irresistible attraction. Such movement is similar to planetary satellite travel in space. In the Hakafa, we are drawn to the altar because the altar is a symbol of Judaism. As soon as Avrid arrived in Canaan, he built an altar there and proclaimed the knowledge of the true God. When he settled in Hebron and wherever he went, he built altars. He accepted likewise and so did Yahweh. At these altars, the patriarchs preached the new faith, which is symbolically represented by the altar. Namely, the lesson of sacrifice. The readiness to withdraw to yield some aspects of one's freedom and indulge in recognition of the mighty, who is the source of all bounties. The ethic of retreat or withdrawal is rooted in the Kabbalistic mystery of cynicism, self contraction, without which the creation of the world would have been impossible. The question is asked since God is infinite and encompassing all, how can God create a finite world extraneous to himself? Luran and Kabbalah answers that God retreated in order to make room for a finite world. He metaphorically withdrew out of his love for men and for the world. I, I, I do want to point out that when we witnessed on August 7th in the afternoon and August 8th in 1910, October 7th, October, on October 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 
the amount of soldiers who reported was way over 100%. You know, any time that educators, people my age, are worried about the young people who are all hypnotically connected to their various screens and don't have a sufficient amount of ideology in order to justify the continuation of our people, should all be embarrassed. The amount of dedication, of sacrifice, of self-sacrifice, the holiness of spirit is exactly what he's, what he's seeking about here. The doctrine of symptom has moral relevance to man and is the foundation of our morality. If God withdrawn creation as a result of his withdrawal, then guided by the principle of Mithya Abey, we are called upon to do the same. Jewish ethics calls upon us in certain situations to engage in self-limitation and recoil from the full range of options available to us in life. In general, the sacrifice is asked for us in minimum. The Torah was not given to angels, and asceticism is not a Jewish way of life. Man is a natural being with desires which may legitimately be satisfied. But his journey through life, he's asked to bend his course by relinquishing some small part of life's many options. Thereby, he will acknowledge the source of all, who's at the center of all existence. The table has been equated to an old because the table we eat biological activity, what we partake with dignity, with blessings, with primitive foods. We indulge in a full range of nourishing, what we withdraw in fast days, and from particular foods. In a similar manner, all its food prescribe and, circ and circumscribe. They do not stifle but deflect us to the altar, even as we move on our chosen path of life. The concept of withdrawal is clearly manifest on the Sabbath. Torah says you can work six days, six work days, and do all your tasks, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath unto God your Lord. There's a positive allowance for a six-day period, but on the seventh to incline oneself toward the center. This is the message of the altar, of the patriarchs, and of the couple around the altar. In a circle, the point of departure is the point of arrival. We are always returning to the same place despite all our motion. In contrast, to travel in a straight line means to move further away from one's beginning. To Jews, the past are remained intimately close. Abraham is not a mythical figure from the mystique dawn of history. We cry annually with young Yosef, with brothers whose brothers conspired to throw him into a pit. The state of Israel, the central fact of modern Jewish history, came in because even after 1900 years of exile, the land of Israel continues to fascinate us. For centuries on the ninth of Av, we sit on the ground in mourning and cry actual tears and painful remembrances of destruction of temples. Gentiles can understand that we missed the mourning for Jerusalem, the city of David, whose welfare ever remains embedded in our consciousness. In the Seventh Day Festival of Sukkot, we entertain in our Sukkot the seven machines and distinguished guests out from Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Yosef, Moshe, and David, and Solomon. We greet them and bid them and join our family in celebration. Our point of departure in the temporary world is inextricably bound to our point of arrival from the past. We live in both simultaneously. We just have a minute left. The Gemara tells us that the end of days God is going to make a circle for Tzadikim. Amin Bihir, Sos, when he formed Rabbi Lezer, Atina Kadish Baruch, Lassot, Mephol, and Tzadikim, who you shave the name, the Ganadim, but go Ethel, the Ethel, Mari, the Ethel, Shenemna, the Omar, the Omar, he named the Gibbon, he named the Yoshim, Zeshem, Tivin, Lo, Nagila, the Nismacha, Bishota. So if you notice, I have a couple of more sources, and it's more sources that I have, I speak a lot more about the circle. And we made a circle when we came through the sea and after we split, and Miriam made that circle and she danced. We danced in a circle around the golden calf, that same circle. Sometimes it's a moment of spiritual understanding and sometimes it's a moment of spiritual virtue we use. We're completely confounded. But we're told at the end of days it's going to be the circle. When we think now back at this idea that on Tuba Av, the girls are going to dance in a circle, and you can connect it back to the Midrash, the Yushalmi, that Tosut quotes, 
that we got out of the graves on Tuba on the beginning, leaving the graves, coming to life, creating a circle and dancing on the circle. Everything I've been speaking about today has all been the same thing. The way that we're raised is we're logical, and we're logical, we go from one point to the other. But that's not our experiences, because we don't leave the past behind. We take the past with us, but sometimes we live it as if it's raw, if it's real, as if it's happening right now. And sometimes to do that is an obligation, to see ourselves as if we live in it. To feel both the slavery and the liberation, to feel the two parts of, of what Rav Levi Yitzchak said that Yaakov felt at that moment. Yosef is yet alive, but the Galut is going to begin, but that's just the first stage for the Galut to be able to end. It's to be able to live within the circle, which is an essential amount of our Jewish practice. Two last points. What Tzadik, or I have for you over here, tells us that when the day comes, and we're going to think about what they did. It's the verse in Amos. They turned our holidays into mourning. But we're also told that our mourning will be turned into holidays. But Tzadik says that when Mashiach comes, Tisha B'Av will be a holiday, which means a seven-day holiday. The first day, Cholomoli, and the last day will be Tuba. That means that we're going to have a holiday which is worthwhile celebrating, one which will be complete, but what happens on that seventh day? How is it going to be celebrated? As we're told, dancing in a circle. But the verse I quoted from the Gemara has a little bit more than just anything. It was, it was also pointing the finger and saying, there is God, which means God created the world by disappearing. God created the world by becoming invisible. God created the world by its symptoms. A point is going to come that as we dance in that circle, we're going to have enlightenment. And we're going to realize that God is in the center of that circle. And all the things that happen to us in life, and everything I'm saying now is not logical. I can't explain it. But at some point, we're going to have comfort for we to see that God was there in the center of the circle all the time. And when those terrible things happen, God was there in the circle. And then when the circle goes around to this other point, and we're able to get to that moment of celebration. God is there as well. We hope and we pray that we're able to stand up from the ground, to start dancing this incredible, heroic dance, this dance of happiness and joy, and total acknowledgement of God in our presence. Thanks to Rabbi Khan. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you're welcome to keep the sheets if you'd like. If not, you can leave them outside the bait and drop of the table on your right. So.